Om Amriteshwariye Namaha. So a very, very warm welcome to all who have uh, joined us here this morning. And uh, in particular, a big welcome to our esteemed panelists who will be each sharing their insights on the topic of enabling technology for social impact. No doubt this subject matter has brought all of us here together and um, is a matter that is very topical, very important, touches technology, touches each of our lives. And so the um, C20 working group in, uh, that oversees technology, security and transparency issues, um, this working group is really, really very grateful and proud to have the uh, list of um, panelists we have today. Each bring to the table, uh, each bring to the table a very um, rich and um, uh, insightful, and I'm sure everyone's waiting to hear from the panelists. Uh, just to... Um, uh, a couple of things I would like to highlight is that this working group, Technology, um, Security and Transparency, TST, uh, of the C20 uh, engagement arm of the G20, um, it focuses on several issues when it comes to technology. In particular, today, we are looking for issues relating to accessibility and affordability of technology and how technology is impacting so society, the social impacts of technology. What can we do to improve? Particularly, what policy requirements, what policy changes may be needed to make technology a lot more uh, of an effective enabler for uh, better social well-being. So um, I will say a, a little bit more throughout you know, the, the event, but right now I would like to very much welcome Mr. Apurv Gulkani as our first speaker. Um, just a short uh, introduction to Mr. Gulkani who has, uh, has achieved so much uh, and uh, uh, very, very happy to have him here. He's the head research at the OMI Foundation, which is a policy research and social innovation think tank. Mr. Kulkani champions the rights of women and persons with disability and is working towards making the urban mobility ecosystem universally accessible. His research on mobility experience of persons with disabilities, as well as job creation for women, has received national recognition. Recent, recently, the Honorable President of India fel felicitated Mr. Gulkani with the National Award for Individual Excellence to recognize him for the impact created through his work. Mr. Kulkani's recent innovation titled Digi Digital Mobility Subsidy was declared the winner of the Smart Solutions Challenge by UN India and National Institute of Urban Affairs. He's also an expert member of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and, and much, much more. Um, he has um, also um, a technologist at heart and Mr. Kulkani has a master's in business administration from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he was a Stanford Reliance Dhirubhai Fellow. Um, he's also a chartered accountant, like I am, and so um, very proud of that particular fact, um, Apur. And he's a passionate cyclist and has completed three half marathons. So. Over to you, uh, Mr. Kulkani, um, and uh, very much looking forward to hearing you share your insights into how technology can em enable social impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure to meet a fellow chartered accountant. Um, well, I had a brilliant start to the morning already in that case. Uh, <clears throat> uh, should we load up the presentation? Well, uh, 
let me begin by thanking um, the, the working group members for having me, um, for the opportunity of sharing our research and insights, and also for the opportunity of learning from all the esteemed panelists over here. Uh, for those of uh, the audience member who live with a visual disability the way I do, um, I'm a brown man wearing short black hair, sporting a beard and a pair of uh, eyeglasses. I'm wearing a blue shirt and a gray Indian dress coat. Um, <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So just to uh, have a quick introduction about OMI, uh, OMI Foundation is a think tank. Uh, we do policy research and uh, uh, we work towards social uh, impact. And uh, we specialize in mobility, innovation, governance, um, and public good. Uh, we really believe that transport and mobility systems are life arteries of economy. They help in unlocking the full value of human capital. Uh, by enabling access to various educational, employment, healthcare, entertainment, recreational opportunities. Our work is um, focused around three centers of excellence. The first center on urban, uh, for, on future of mobility focuses on urban mobility, everything from public transport, intermediate public transport, such as rickshaws and taxis, um, as well as personal mobility. Our second center focuses on clean mobility through our research in electric vehicles, as well as clean fuels, such as green hydrogen, bio CNG, and so on. The Center for Inclusive Mobility focuses on mobility needs, experiences, and um, uh, requirements of uh, women, people with disabilities, and other mobility disadvantaged groups, as well as we focus on uh, a new category of uh, workforce called platform workers here in India, otherwise known as gig and independent contractors, so gig workers and independent contractors in, in uh, rest of the world. Um, we have uh, we've been fortunate enough to receive uh, multiple awards for our work, uh, most recent uh, being the Smart Solutions Challenge, uh, uh, which was there in the introduction. Next slide, please. So, you know, uh, um, as we go ahead, um, what is really accessibility vis-a-vis -vis technology? And uh, we researchers tend to uh, sometimes complicate things through technical jargons and definitions, but I'd like to keep it simple. Uh, if I was to explain this to a five-year-old, I would tell them, uh, you can imagine people who live with disabilities, be it uh, visual, be it locomotor, uh, face multiple barriers. Accessibility is a feature which enables usability of technology for these individuals and many more, irrespective of their disability, so that they're able to access opportunities and create value for themselves, for their families, communities, and the economy. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of accessible technology. Next slide, please. So you see uh, you know, a very familiar wheelchair. Uh, this is a simple technology. Um, imagine an army veteran who has acquired a disability, a locomotive disability in the line of service. And through use of this technology, he's now able to go to work, earn livelihood, and put food for, on the table for his families. The second one is an example of closed caption, wherein a young uh, development student um, uh, is able to access video lectures and understand and follow the uh, lessons because their closed captioning is available, perhaps even sign language interpretation. Uh, digital interactions are a very important avenue. And uh, to various interventions like text to speech technology, basically technology that reads you out uh, from the screen, <clears throat> the output contents on the screen. Uh, someone like me, who lives with a visual disability, is able to interact uh, with that technology and use it to send emails, to do my research, even make notes in the meetings. Um, and so this is incredibly empowering because with these technologies, people are able to participate fully in the economy and create value, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I'd just like to give a quick demo about how, uh, how is it to work with digital uh, accessibility on a smartphone, for uh, example. Next slide contains a demo. Uh, if you can play, it's a 20 second uh, clip. This is how somebody who's blind could take notes on an iPhone. Voice over on. Mail. 15 on ready mails. Camera. Notes. Double tap to open. Use three. Cap 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 age. Hotel. Cap age. Hot. U. I. India. 
Hi. Should I continue? Yes. Um, I think the presentation has to be loaded up again. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> behind the scenes of this accessible technology is a presupposition that uh, the gadgets, the technology, the, the uh, instruments that are developed follow certain best practices uh, and guidelines uh, of accessibility. And this enables um, other ancillary tools such as the text-to-speech engine that you saw right now to be able to uh, relay the information uh, back to the user with a disability, also help them interact. And so it's, it's very important to bake this in, in every product uh, right from the design stage. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, you know, the question in front of us is really, uh, why should we care uh, about accessibility in technology? Next slide. And, and uh, you know, here are some facts. 15% of the uh, global population lives with some form of disability, be it sensory or cognitive, as per United Nations. Uh, if you were to think about the influence on the uh, disposable income that they have to themselves, their families, friends, it amounts to $8 trillion. If that was a country, it would be the third largest economy and certainly a part of the G20. Uh, but uh, till that happens, you know, it's a, it's a big market. While we understand the opportunity over here, there's also, uh, you know, we have to take cognizance of the risk. When accessibility breaks down and people with disabilities are not able to uh, participate fully in the economy, ILO estimates that the loss can be as much as 7% of the GDP. Today, when recessionary pressures loom large all over the world, just imagine what that 7% of GDP could mean for our individual economies and for, for that matter, even our institutions and uh, for us as an individual. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to highlight some instances of inaccessibilities, uh, which has come about through our research uh, in mobility through primary surveys and secondary literature reviews, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, next slide. So on the, <clears throat> on the first uh, uh, left-hand side, you'd see a person in wheelchair trying to access a bus stop. Imagine the army veteran that we had uh, spoken about earlier. He's going to a client meeting, trying to catch a bus, but the bus that comes uh, to pick him up is a high flow bus, does not have a ramp, and therefore he's not able to make that journey, miss a client appointment, probably miss business, right? And that's a, that's a, a big thing. <clears throat> uh, if that person was to take a, a, a metro or a subway, for instance, they can't climb stairs, so they'll probably have to access elevators. Many times these elevators don't function. For someone who, like me who lives with a visual disability, nowadays in the elevators you have touch screen uh, panels, which means I cannot independently select the floor to which I have to go. So there's a technology piece available, but I'm not able to use it. That's, that's uh, limiting the return on investment that has been put in, in that elevator and creating that infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to disaster situations or distress situations, people with disabilities are at, uh, at increased amount of risk. Imagine a deaf person who's trying to make a distress call to an emergency service, only to realize that the person on the other end is not going to be able to communicate with them because they will be using audio modes and this person is not able to use the same communication medium. And therefore, uh, the, the vulnerability of this population is much higher. Next slide, please. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip a couple of things. I'm gonna come straight to digital payments. Uh, nowadays, <clears throat> you have uh, payments from your smartphones, you have uh, smart uh, point of sale terminals, and many times when these terminals or smartphones or technologies don't follow the accessibility standards, uh, people are not able to make the payment. So you imagine you've selected your items in the shopping cart, but you're not able to make the payment. You're not able to complete the transaction, uh, which is again, loss of business. Uh, uh, when I am, for instance, at a, at a uh, physical shop and I have to complete transaction on a, a point of sale terminal, which is digital, I have to tell my uh, authentication code, which is a grave security, financial security risk, right? And so there are instances like these which, uh, which uh, uh, when accessibility breaks down 
And therefore, for someone uh, uh, like an army veteran who's not able to use the bus service, they have to uh, make use of their personal vehicles or cars, which is not only bad for the environment, but also expensive for them. This, in, uh, this not only impacts the quality of life, it increases the cost of living, the cost of earning livelihood, and cost of doing business. And that's why it's incredibly important. Next slide, please. Uh, excuse me, next slide, please. So, you know, uh, what are the reasons for these accessibility breakdowns, really? Um, you know, there are many reasons, but just to highlight a few of them, the number one, uh, uh, so the first reason is that you don't have enough data. Many countries around the world today don't even have reliable estimates of their populations of persons with disabilities. Forget a gender mix of their population, or for that matter, the, the functional limitations that come with that. Similarly, many a times, the standards and guidelines that can make products and technology accessible are either not available or poorly uh, implemented. There's also an awareness gap in the, uh, in, among the key decision makers, designers, policy makers, technologists, and as a result of which, where simple interventions could have opened up the product services um, and facilities to a wider section of population, that does not happen. Um, naturally, when the awareness is uh, on the lower end, uh, you don't have meaningful budgets to make accessibility interventions. And lastly, uh, accessibility and disability related data um, are not monitored, they're not reported, and that, that does not keep, like that, that uh, is uh, detrimental because it constrains the, the virtuous cycle of continuous improvement. Next slide, please. So, you know, what can we do really? What, what should be, uh, what are our recommendations uh, coming from a policy perspective? Next slide, please. I have five recommendations for you and a thumb rule. The first recommendation is that uh, we should mandate collection and dissemination of gender, age, and disability disaggregated data. This includes population estimates, uh, labor force estimates, uh, you know, various other economic uh, uh, data that comes out from the government. I think that's going to be incredibly important because then it enables effective policy making. The second one is uh, announce, notify, and effectively enforce standards of accessibility, guidelines of accessibility for various products and services. Number three is create awareness through not just training and sensitizations of people who are in decision-making positions, who are in leadership positions, who are entrepreneurs and technologists, but also uh, uh, as a part of education curriculum from school and college uh, in the formative years of these uh, future leaders about how accessibility improvements can be made, why is it important, what is the cost of not doing uh, these implementations. The fourth one is dedicate meaningful budgets for accessibility improvements. World Bank estimates that when accessibility improvements are baked in, are considered right from the planning and design stage, they account for mere one to 2% of product, uh, project costs. If it's considered at a later stage, the cost is higher. Be it a greenfield project or a brownfield project or uh, you know, repairs and maintenance, Accessibility improvements are a must. We need to have funds allocated towards them meaningfully. Lastly, we need to monitor and report progress on these fronts. Uh, the reporting that various countries do um, as a part of their own budgetary analysis uh, is one avenue. And uh, even more important avenue is the SDG reporting that happens uh, for each of the 17 in the, uh, um, you know, goals and various indicators under them. I think there's a large opportunity for us to be able to report, hold ourselves accountable and develop a roadmap based on that. Next slide, please. Before I conclude, I'm gonna share uh, uh, a teaser with you. Next slide. We at OMI recently completed an all India survey constituting 40 cities and over 50,000 people, 20 FGDs on mobility perceptions needs uh, uh, and uh, you know, requirements 
of uh, citizens. This population uh, accounts for about 25% of urban population of India. We've taken care to have 5% of our respondents live with some form of functional limitations or disability. There are 40% women and 2% LGBTQ respondents across various age range. We believe that this information is going to be incredibly helpful, not just for policy making and, uh, and having the maximum bang for the buck uh, for, for the country, but also for researchers, for students, for businesses to take important decisions uh, to unlock the full potential of uh, mobility and empower the uh, people who live with disabilities as also other uh, communities who probably otherwise would have had mobility disadvantages. Um, I'm incredibly excited to share that we will be uh, releasing this uh, in the in a coming few weeks. And uh, I would request um, all of you to keep in touch. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Here are our social media handles. I would encourage all of you to uh, subscribe. My email address is right here, apworb.kulkrni at omifoundation.org for my friends with uh, visual disabilities. Uh, please do keep in touch. And I look forward to any opportunities to work together and create impact. With this, I conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Apur. It was really it, very inspiring to hear all of the great work. Um, now what I will do, and, and thank you so much for as like a professional finishing right on time on the on the twenty minute mark, um, I'll now uh, pass over the introductions uh, the, uh, uh, to Dr. Prashad Nair. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Nava Subramanian. Uh, no, thank you, Apoor. Uh, very nice, uh, uh, very nice recommendations. I'm sure we'll have a lot of uh, inputs for our zero draft. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to introduce our uh, next speaker, Mr. Rafi Saif. Uh, he's the founder and director of Policy Plus. Rafi is a lawyer by training, a researcher by trade, and an inclusive collaborator by heart. Uh, he has founded Policy Plus, which is a youth-driven and multidisciplinary think tank based in Jakarta, Indonesia, with an international outlook that focuses on human rights, uh, good governance, and sustainability. Uh, so prior to this, Rafi was working in consulting and academia, and he was also part of the Indonesian COVID-19 task force. He currently serves as the vice chairman of the policy center of the University of Indonesia Alumni Association. He's an avid writer and his uh, commentary, his uh, opinions and op-eds have been published in leading newspapers, including uh, the Jakarta Post and the Jakarta Globe and also Malaysia's uh, The Star and the Southeast Globe. Uh, over to you, Rafi. Thank you so much for that introduction and uh, congratulations to the first panelist who really broke down the nuances between technology and social impact. I'll do my best to top that. So uh, to the organizing committee, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm wishing you a very good morning in sunny Jakarta. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. I understand that my fellow panelists have experiences on a wide range of issues when it comes to digitalization, but I hope that in this instance, I will try my best to provide a unique perspective on the nexus between technology and social impact. Specifically, I hope to discuss how technology can serve as a catalyst in driving change, uh, in my eyes, civic engagement. In my view, civic engagement sits at the heart of public participation, where people either individually or collectively promote, engage, and take community participation. Indeed, I believe that the most important role that we can have today, and this is shared by many people, is that of the role of citizen. Because society, people, are levers that can bring change forward. Now, you might be thinking, this sounds fantastic, but what does this have to do with technology? And I must admit that a decade ago, I have to be frank and honest in saying I never made the connection. A decade ago, I was concerned about impact, and I'm still that today. But in my view, I thought that writing in newspapers was enough. Uh, I thought that was the way to drive change. But looking at it today, technology has become 
the cudgel, the platform for information and true change. Uh, in this instance, information without question has transformed over the years, and the acceleration of that information is viewed, made, and even processed. It will continue to change, not only throughout the years, but at the very moment we are talking today. All of us, young people, academics, public officials, businessmen, we're all grappling with this sort of change. And it's not different when it comes to civil society. Technology, for the most part, has truly become a defining factor that accelerates for the greater good. Technology has allowed, I, I hope I'm correct to say this, it's allowed a spring awakening, really, for advocacy, insights, opinions to flourish. Everyone can now discuss. Everyone can now have a voice. It has paved the way for communities to organize and provide us to speak truth to power. We are living in an age where voices can be heard and citizen journalism, for example, is within its peak. However, looking at the other side, we have to face certain realities on the ground, which is that as much as technology can give, as much as technology can enable, it also has the capacity to serve to muzzle, manipulate, misconstrue, and to even disable. Technology for me, to be honest, is life's greatest blessing. It allows us to have conversations like we're having today. It connects all of us, but this other side is something that we need to be aware of. Whether we like it or not, technology has propelled us into an age, perhaps almost since when man created fire, discovered fire really, but like fire, it can have the capacity to give us the warmth needed, but can spur out of control. That is why I believe that this working group is more relevant now more than ever, because we are not only talking about technology per se, there's a reason, I believe, why this working group is called technology, security, and transparency, because it is incredibly important for us to see technology as a tool for innovation and for accountability. At the same time, we are in almost a loop similar to what we know about the barber's paradox, right? So who's going to cut the barber's hair? So in this instant, who's going to keep technology accountable? when uh, when or the users accountable? Is it the government? In retrospect, who will keep the governments accountable? Citizens, but who will keep the citizens accountable? But I digress. Civic engagement in this instant must be propelled through a variety of factors. And I would like to break it down to three points really, collaboration, equality, and empowerment. So in the sense of collaboration, there is this pentahelix known greatly when we were handling COVID-19 in Indonesia, and ha it has perpetuated ever since. The pentahelix uh, is comprised of businesses, government, academia, community, and media, where we need to collectively be in close contact with each other to ensure that technology can be used for the betterment of social impact and not be politically motivated. The second is equality. Equality is in the forefront of civil society organizations. When we think about advocacy strategies, uh, for example, we need to ensure that it empowers and serves and does not serve as a tool that marginalizes specific communities. We might be here today talking about artificial intelligence or a few months back, metaverse, but we also need to take a breather and remember that we also have a responsibility that no one let, gets left behind. Technology, after all, is very multifaceted. For example, what does a digital ecosystem mean with when it comes to, for example, an elementary school teacher I met at, at West Nusa Tenggara in one of the remote, most remote areas in Indonesia? What does technology mean to him? Civic engagement makes sure that the bottom line of basic services like connectivity is conducted in remote areas. We need to make sure that we're able to accelerate this kind of technology, embrace this kind of technology, but make sure that everyone is empowered within the process. It's, it's not enough that everyone has a phone, but the lights are off. It's not enough that everyone has a phone, everyone has Wi-Fi, but water is still an issue. We need to make sure that technology can address those issues hands-on. And the third is the empowerment of voices. We need to allow uh, journalism, for example, to thrive because it's one of the hallmarks of democracy. 
I was in Jakarta a few months back listening to stories from citizen journalists who were targeted for speaking truth to power. They were victims of doxing, hacking, and even uh, intimidation. I also met with activists from Myanmar who are exiled. They're currently in Bangkok. We need to make sure that their stories, their voices are continued to be heard using technology. So in terms of policy recommendations per se, there are many, but I hope that in this short amount of time, I can say that we need to collectively make sure that policies regarding technology needs to be approached and looked at the lens of human rights and good governance. That sensitivity is very important. And also we hope that this working group, this discussion shows that having empathetic leadership is really a strong component that we have to advocate for. At the end of the day, social impact and technology needs to work hand in hand. We need to make sure that technology is used as a, cap a catapult for change. Let's make sure that technology is utilized as a public good and continue to, good, to do good as we move forward together. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Rafi. That was very, very, um, you know, good to hear about all the points. They're so relevant that the uh, common man, the citizen, you know, approach to technology is very, very important and um, uh, and the rights to information and, you know, a lot of issues around data privacy and uh, data rights, you know, arise, which I'm sure people will have um, comments or notes make on uh, later in the program. Um, so over to Prashant again. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nava. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to uh, it, uh, introduce uh, uh, Mr. Osama, are you here? I'm just, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce Mr. Osama Mansur, uh, founder and director of the Digital Empowerment Foundation. Uh, Digital Empowerment Foundation has done, uh, you know, a really an awesome job in terms of uh, policy uh, with respect to the digital uh, aspects in India. It's, it's a global leader in the mission of eradicating information poverty from India and the global South using digital tools uh, through this organization. Uh, Osama found this in 2002. He has uh, worked uh, for over 25 years in this, uh, in this field. Uh, the various areas that he has worked include journalism, new media, and software enterprise before he established uh, DEF, Digital Empowerment Foundation, to empower the masses. And it has impacted an amazing 20 million people directly with a footprint of uh, 1,000 locations and 9,000 plus digital foot soldiers across 130 districts in 24 states of India. Amazing. Uh, a British uh, Chevenin scholar and international visitor leadership program fellow of the US State Department, Osama is a social entrepreneur, author, columnist, impact speaker, angel investor, storyteller, and mentor. He sits on several government and policy committees in India and international organizations working in the areas of the internet access, digital inclusion, and misinformation. He has co-authored more than six books, including Internet Economy of India and Net Chakra, which is uh, uh, an analogy of the 15 years of internet in India. His latest book as a co-editor is COVID-19, The New Mor Normal, and How to Survive a New World Order. Osama has instituted 10 awards for recognizing digital in innovations for development in uh, South India. Uh, I think we are, you know, very, uh, Absolutely uh, excited to have you uh, share your, uh, you know, very, very outstanding work with this audience. Over to you, Mr. Osama. Thank you. Hi, thank you, uh, Prashant, uh, for uh, a long introduction. And uh, uh, it was great to hear Rafi and it was great to hear uh, Apurv. Uh, both of you uh, provided a lot of enlightenment, uh, especially Apurva, uh, because not many times we hear about the part that is usually 
you know go unseen and invisible so thank you for those uh, you know visibility to the fact of life uh, uh, i would be careful about the topic that we are discussing uh, enabling technology for social impact uh, uh, and uh, and and in this about 18 minutes or 17 minutes i would like to highlight uh, that what is the area of social that we are talking about and what is the area of technology that is actually being able to impact and should be able to impact it um, so certainly we all uh, are saying technology but with this technology what we mean is that the technology which is driving information economy and the knowledge economy uh, and therefore very strongly linked with internet nuances of internet uh, and digital technologies and what it is actually making our lives about. Um, uh, of course, we have come a long way in India since uh, 1995, 15th of August, when internet was introduced in India. But from the technological perspective, uh, uh, much earlier, so we would say that we certainly have a 30 year of history of internet bringing to our life. And, uh, you know, usually when, when some technological innovation and invention happens, it trickles down to the social part or the masses uh, not very quickly. So, uh, you know, even if it is wheel, you know, wheel is a technology, but to become a socially viable uh, usability of wheel and how it is used and how affordable it is and so on and so forth, it must have taken many, 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 many years and even now. Uh, so technology, how it relates to the masses, we have already gone 30 years. And if I say that access to technology, I would like to just bring in a little bit of a statistics that half the world is connected while other half of the world is not connected. We still are short about 3 billion people not connected, not do not have access to internet and therefore do not have access to this new technology called information technology or digital technology or uh, internet. And incidentally, all this entire 2 billion or 2.5 or close to 3 billion people are the people who can be easily bracketed into social sector or a social area because they are the bottom of the pyramid because all the top people are already connected. The metros are connected, the cities are connected, the urban areas are connected, um, uh, the, the more uh, affluent people are connected, governments are connected, private sectors are connected, all their staffs are connected and so on and so forth. But it is the masses which is not really fully connected and not affordably at all. Um, so what actually, and, and coming to India, since we are discussing mostly focusing in this area and, as, uh, 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 and South Asia and Asian countries, we are the most unconnected region and most unconnected country. Uh, India boasts for the second highest connected country, which is absolutely a fact, but India is also the most unconnected country in the world. You know, it's both because we have a very high population. We are 1.4 billion people. Our connectivity to the internet is less than 50%, um, which is still is the highest in the world or the second highest in the world. Uh, but we still have the rest of the people unconnected. Those who are unconnected are part of the 900 million people who live in rural areas. 900 million people live in rural areas. Uh, and uh, the access in rural areas is extremely poor. Our, our uh, uh, connectivity index or teledensity uh, is just uh, about, uh, you know, 47%. Um, so more people are unconnected even in rural areas and mostly in rural areas. But what is more important is that how quality, uh, qualitatively are they connected? Are they connected uh, very uh, well connected? Can they do transactions? Can, can, can they, they do the work? No, not at all. Uh, so that's where the affordability comes and the quality of uh, connectivity comes and so on and so forth. So I'll give you here two, three examples. Uh, very, very human example. Uh, there are about 450 million people in India who demand job under NREGA. NREGA is, is, is the National Rural Employment Guarantee uh, Act, which uh, gives as an act 
uh, 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 power to the to the people to demand a job of 100 days minimum 100 days in a year and it's an act which government cannot uh, uh, you know um, uh, really uh, uh, say no to uh, now this uh, year in the budget it has been decided and declared that every payment related to nrega has to be through aadhar linked payment and all this is technology by the way aadhar is a digital identity and this is uh, aadhar link payment means banking system which is gone online and that means it, it will use the efficiency of efficiency of online to uh, make the payment uh, online and which is great in terms of transparency in terms of technology in terms of efficiency but more than 50% people who are part of the population under nrega have no infrastructure to receive or make the payment online or having the aadhar linked payments it's not only online but it has to be linked with aadhar so the the point uh, is that when we talk about technology impact on social what is very important to think is that uh, technology itself is not bad uh, you know uh, technology itself doesn't create misinformation and fake news for that matter it is us who do by forwarding it you know uh, by receiving it by forwarding it or by not recognizing it so similarly technology can provide all the efficiencies um, uh, technology can promise all the efficiencies for example india is highly oral uh, and, and many of the south asian countries they all are oral countries they are not written countries and therefore biometrically recognizing your identity is a great technology and efficiency and that too when you do real time but the human intervention says uh, that it's mandatory when you make that you can get your food you can get your education you can get your health you can get your finances through the most efficient technology great up to that point it's great but after that when you say this is mandatory is that still great is that policy great so it's very important to know that how our social life how our social ecosystem how our social impact is actually negatively impacted by taking technological policy decision which is binding to the people to accept it without having a digital infrastructure information infrastructure literacy infrastructure awareness infrastructure and so on and so forth i'll give you four example which we all um, uh, had a view to uh, uh, ex- uh, at the time of covid at the t- time of covid indian government declared that everybody can get vaccination uh only if you put uh, your name online and you register online the question is that it's great efficient you can go online and put it and it's very easy you don't have to travel and things like that the point is how many people are literate enough to go online how many people have affordability to go online how many people have devices to go online so why to make mandatory this technology which is not even available to everybody it's something like i will give you a license only when you drive to the road but obviously the road is not even available so you know how can you make the license compulsory for some people because you can't have those license if there is no road and there is no uh, you know car to drive or learn learn from the car so this is this is interesting the second part is that government of india also declared that uh, all the students are allowed to go and do online education which is great awesome in india there are 320 million children go to government schools 80 to 90% of them have no access to technology no access to online no availability of devices so how are you making this social impact through the technology i mean there is one way you can say now you can read and write and you can do education online perfect nobody is denying that computer can be a te- great technology internet has got repository of information you can do education online but can that be mandatory to pass an exam or to attend a class is something that we need to think of similarly about the online payment sim- similarly about um, so access to information access to health 
access to food, access to education, access to finance. Are they all made dependent on digital? Yes. Should be made mandatory? No. Is what the debate that we need to have. Because technology is a great tool. For example, I'll give you, I work in rural India. I wrote an article saying that, uh, you know, there are, there are people who pay 250 rupees for one page of printout in poor areas. Why? 250 rupees for one page printout. Nobody can fathom this fact, but that is a fact. Why do they pay 250 rupees? Because it is not available. The photocopying has made necessary for filing an application. Then it is not available in their area. In the, it is not. Uh, 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 it is. It is not connected in their area. They have to travel 20, 30 kilometers. They have to uh, forego their daily wages to go there and get it done and then put it. So you lose your day job. You have to travel and pay and then. You don't pay one rupee for a photocopy. You pay five rupees or six rupees or 10 rupees because in remote areas, it's, it costs higher. So is this technology can, can, can create, which is promising social impact? Is it really creating a social impact? No, it is becoming costlier. It is becoming expensive. It is becoming unaffordable. And it is violation of human rights. So what is, what is very important for all of us to, uh, to, to, when we are, and it's great that, you know, uh, India has been at the forefront of, uh, you know, developing other kind of technology, forefront of developing uh, several kind of uh, these technology, but actually it is how it is relating to the policy is something very, very important. So my crux of the, the, the contribution in this uh, you know, session is that technology, enabling technology to create a social impact is directly proportional to not the invention of technology or innovation of technology, but the policies, how we make the policies. Policies are directly responsible for creating technology impact on social good or social impact. And social impact is very big, very, very big. You know, it directly relates to the poor people. India and South Asia and most of the people who are unconnected are the bunch of socially, uh, you know, relevant people. That's where the social impact is. And that's where we are having this challenge that how do we make technology reach yeah, with affordability and so on and so forth. And I would like to end by uh, mentioning a few numbers, uh, especially in India. We have 1.4 billion population. We have uh, only 300, we have 350 million dumb phone users, which is the feature phone users. We have 580 million smartphone users. We have rural teledensity, which is only 47%. Um, or 43 percent and uh, uh, we have women who is the 50 percent of the population is about uh, you know 30 to 35 percent or close to 40 percent uh, behind using or access to technology uh, so and all this is relates to the policies can we make a policy where the phones are first accessible to women you will have a great gender digital uh, equitability. Can we make a decision that 1.5 million schools in the country have the broadband connectivity so that they can have digital access? Can we ensure that all the health centers, sub health centers and community health centers have video conferencing facilities so that you can have access to a doctor without having doctor present in front of you? Very simple technology. Is that possibility? Uh, so, you know, Similarly, can the payment which is being done and asked online should be made affordable to the people to take care of their travel, uh, there should be a subsidy and so on and so forth. All these are something that is all related to not innovation in technology, but innovation in policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mansar. It's you have raised right at the heart you know, of things here for this, for this um, uh, what do you call, say, uh, panel, uh, the issue being, I can hear loud and strong is about 
not just accessibility, but also affordability and needing the necessary policies for making technology available to actually make you know, um, the so-called the so-called as you say, social impact, which is a, which can be a nebulous concept on its own. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and what we I'd like to do now is uh, take some questions. We already have had some questions come up on Q and A uh, section. And I'd like to start with Gokul's who asked, what if accept, and so this, this session is op uh, open for all the three uh, panel speakers. Um, the first question is, what if accessible technology is not affordable? So for instance, he says, all blind can't, uh, uh, having a phone, you know, it's not a solution for everyone who is say blind. So, Open to the floor. Would like to go first. I suppose Apoor, you. Um, this is very much coming from your your session. This question. Yeah. Uh, no, I can I can take this one for sure. I also replied uh, in the chat, but uh, you know affordability of technology is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important, um, and uh, th this is an important focus area for policymakers as well as industry. <clears throat> I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, um, having acknowledged that, uh, the, the answer really is uh, three things. Number one is that scale. Right now, what happens is the uh, uh, people with disabilities, uh, to reach them, it's, it's a very fragmented market. So uh, what happens is your uh, solutions are not able to be produced at scale. So we need some interventions over here. Uh, perhaps some financial and non-fiscal incentives that can help the entrepreneurs and change makers in this space to tighten that initial curve, right? That's number one. Number two is uh, reducing the cost of production, which comes from two folds, number, uh, which is first is scale, but also use indigenous uh, solutions. When we adopt, uh, uh, you know, solutions which were developed for the global north, for the Western world, and then implement it over here in India uh, or other developing parts, naturally the, scale, the, the cost of technology is gonna be high. So we need indigenous solutions. And uh, number three is we need effective distribution. Um, and a simple example of that, you know, uh, I, I told you that 15% of uh, people with uh, global population live with some form of disability. I would argue that number would be far, far higher if these glasses, spectacles, for instance, were not invented, were not easily available. But today, you go to any opticians, forget opticians, you go to a website, you're able to order prescription glasses for yourself. So that the ability to be able to distribute that effectively, and over here again, technology plays an important role, is going to help in bringing that at cost of uh, uh, technology. Very important area and must be focused on. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, can I can I can I also add a little bit to uh, absolutely, absolutely. what uh, Purva said? Uh, so one thing is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, one thing is innovation of technology, availability of technology, access to technology. But you know what? There will never be a situation in the world where everybody can afford, and that's that's where the public good comes, and public access comes, and public access point comes. There will never be. There will always be poor. There will always be affordability challenges that we cannot overcome. Nobody can overcome. That's not a human reality. You know, uh, there will always be poorest of the poor. But the point is that are we enabling it to them so they can walk some time and they can pay less, they can do subsidized. It can be especially made affordable to them or public. That's the reason why we take public transport, right? We don't say just walk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. No, or we cannot walk for you. Okay, yeah. You will have to walk, or you have to, uh, you know, go from one step to the other. So it the approach in policy is to make the technology, you know, available 
in a situation in their language in their culture in their heritage in their uh, medium in their uh, transportable uh, location and so on and so forth that's what it is you know the, everybody will never have a car but the point is that you can still drive in your affordable city i noticed there are quite a few uh, questions in the q and a section and uh, we do have limited time just in case your question doesn't get answered it will be you know answers will be typed out in that section um but can i ask you mr manzar how what are specific policies you think that have worked or you know good examples that have worked or ones that were put out and really worked horribly no so so uh, i mean good that you asked that question and there is uh, it's not that government doesn't have an example when you say policy government comes into the picture uh, right uh, uh, and g20 which is which was concluded in indonesia in bali mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. also released a case book uh and mm -hmm. um, uh, on digital transformation infrastructure and gave an example of indian government's decision on uh, pm wifi or pm wani you know which is basically a last mile access which actually liberalized the entire mm -hmm. licensing system of access to internet or internet service pro providers uh, licensing fees now in india anybody can buy internet and sell internet without license it's legal Uh -huh. it's legal uh -huh. now nobody has to pay, uh, become a buyer or seller to have a license you can do i can do you can do rafi can do and and uh, you know anybody can buy internet in india and sell internet in india there is a mechanism done so that's a great access oriented policy that has been liberalized but the point is that are uh, if the if the private sector not going and buying those internet to make it publicly available then we need to ask question to ourselves but it creates an entrepreneurship but the worst decision uh, so that that's a very good example of the first one which is about making access available in india to the last mile there is a policy that enables us to do second uh, which is the worst uh, decision is that we know that poorest of the poor in india are looking for a job under nrega and they cannot make online payment they cannot do or do online attendance but the government has made a policy necessity to link the payment online with aadhar and by the way aadhar act itself says that it is not mandatory <laughs> it's something like you say that it is not mandatory to come by road to attend a meeting but you know some company says that i will take your interview only if you have come uh, by the road uh, having driven through the road so mm -hmm. you know th these kind of policies are actually subjugating policies and it's harassing policies that should not be done uh, mm -hmm. so so uh, so we have both the exam and not that i i'm more aware about india that's why i'm giving i'm sure mm -hmm. this kind of example would be everywhere uh all over the world especially in the in the world where ai is playing a role to create hate speech and misinformation <laughs> we have examples from everywhere in the world okay um rafi can you think of any good examples from indonesia well uh well i think i had, i need to go, i need to look at the challenges beforehand this this is a very interesting uh discussion nava because really i think if i could just bridge towards what are the main challenges it would have to be two when it comes to this the first would be the ego sectoral that we see because at the end of the day we are civil society we need to speak truth to power and that includes the government sometimes uh at least in the case of indonesia with a vast amount of uh institutional frameworks that are present at present sometimes we don't work in silo so not we're not working together and this needs to be strengthened because what happens if we don't work together there is a a bottleneck in, when it comes to policy so this ego sectoral is something that we really need to uh take into account and the second is how policy translates into their national strategy because it's important when we talk about the affordability of technology we need to make sure that policy is very much grounded I've had situations where um I'll give I'll give a best case and I'll give a worst case as I promise. The worst case was when uh we looked at the most remote areas and the solution that was given by the government was we should launch a podcast. We should launch a singing competition. We should launch a poetry competition, which for me in retrospect looking at the situation on the most remote villages on the ground that's not necessarily the case that they need in the situation that pertains to it the best case of course is that we have developed 
a, a digital ecosystem that presents and allows the opportunity for policies to actually work together. So it, we really do need to make a comprehensive framework that I would like to say an end-to-end -end supply chain that really dictates what is the role of each government institution so that we don't have this discombobulation of uh, policies that are not grounded in reality and what is necessary on the ground. So that's uh, that's the good, the best case, which is a policy approach, and the worst case, which is policy impl implementation that we saw on the ground. I'd like, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to go back to a proof and, um, and I just had a quick look at the questions that have been popping up. And a general theme there, Poof, is about affordability, about financial inclusion, and how do we make to the masses you know, available uh, what policy changes are needed when it comes to, uh, like for instance, um, Balbira has talked about um, technology, uh, sorry, um, tax regimes, <coughs> changes in tax systems perhaps, how do we make that um, sort of policy changes to make technology affordable? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that opportunity. Um, I, so, you know, in the previous question, actually, there were some highlights about public good and the point well taken. In fact, uh, one of the concepts that we have developed uh, pertains to uh, making that possible through use of technology uh, using the India stack, as it's called, to make transport subsidies more commonly available. Um, for anyone who's interested, my contact details, I'll just uh, put in the chat again. I'm happy to share that concept with you. But to your question in particular, there are three um, uh, you know, interventions that come to my mind immediately. Uh, and they also speak to some of the uh, you know, necessities that I had highlighted in my previous response. So towards scale, uh, <clears throat> for instance, we need uh, two enabling factors over here, which is uh, announcement and enforcement of accessible uh, accessibility standards. There's a right for persons with disabilities act in India. There are uh, other similar acts uh, across the world, which mandate this. And uh, availability of these standards is going to be helpful uh, uh, in making sure that people receive the full benefit of the technologies. Over here, public procurement is a very important tool. Governments, uh, as one of the largest uh, procurers across the world, uh, can easily mandate that any, uh, uh, any, any tender that's uh, submitted needs to have accessibility parameters. Your tenders could be scored on those and that will immediately open up the market because now there is real value that anyone is uh, either encashing or missing out uh, uh, with or without accessibility interventions. Number two is uh, again, financial and non-fiscal uh, incentives to the uh, industry to, uh, to you know, like invest in that initial research, development, scaling up process, and uh, also to individuals through subsidization, through, for instance, uh, incorporating relevant uh, provisions in the Income Tax Act or, uh, or other taxation frameworks to be able to uh, increase the affordability of this technology. When you increase the demand side, the supply side will uh, spring to meet that demand, right? So that's the second uh, intervention uh, that I have for you. The third intervention speaks to the industry. You don't always need a law to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I would encourage the industry to look back, introspect, and see how their products and services could be made universally accessible. Publish a roadmap which they will be uh, using to make their products and services prospectively and retrospectively more accessible. And I promise you that this will not only open up the market for the people who live with disabilities, but also other non-disabled individuals. For instance, when we had spoken about the ramp, a mechanical technology innovation that enables a wheelchair user to board a vehicle, it's also helpful for a young mother who's carrying their baby in a pram. Mm -hmm. It also is helpful for people who are old age and need some support to, uh, to make use of public transport. When we make our systems and technologies simple enough, 
it doesn't yeah. just invo- uh, make uh, uh, benefit people who live with cognitive disability in understanding what's happening it also makes it simple uh, for people who are living with language barriers mm-hmm. people who um, are on on a daily basis find financial systems too complicated to be able to make use of the uh, formal uh, system more effectively so there's yeah. a lot to be done over here and these three interventions could be yeah. helpful no, I'm no, so was, pl- if yep. I could just quickly uh, jo- uh, hop in on that because I definitely agree. And just a quick one for me is that uh, there's this whole ecosystem thriving on yep. the startup ecosystem in technology where everyone wants to make the next super app, the next yep. application. Not every solution, especially when it comes to the governance, needs an mm. application. We need to make sure that it's grounded. We, there's, mm. we don't need a super app for, for example, filling in your gas station, which is uh, filling in gas in the gas station, which is currently in process here. So that's a quick note that I want to give. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there needs to be alignment, right? Basically what I hear is alignment between uh, regulators, as well as the people who build things, the technology developers, as well as the users. And uh, so that's where the uh, you know, uh, power of voice comes in. And I'm also very, very happy to hear Apoof talk about simplicity because um, our our Chancellor of Amrita University um, and also the head of C20, Civil Society um, arm of G20, uh, Amma has always advocated that uh, development, you know, like technological development, whatever research development must be useful for society, must be affordable by the common person. And um, and this is clearly coming through because the, the change in technology, the rapid development in technology is um, escalating and truly unprecedented. So uh, thank you. Um, I think we are, the time is uh, there now for us to take a, um, a short breath, uh, just a minute or so. If people want to, and then, um, so if you want to take a very quick break, we'll be back in two minutes. Prashant will come to open the proceedings. Uh, let me once again thank Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Apurf Kulkani, Mr. Osama Manzer, and uh, Mr. Ra- Ra- Rafi Saif. Uh, please stay on because you may get more questions towards the end of this program. We are only halfway through. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. A big clap, I would say, for everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Dr. Prashant can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Can I hear now? Yeah, you're, you're audible, you're audible. Yeah. yeah. Is clear? Voice is clear? Yeah, voice is clear, voice is clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's some background noise, I think, at your place. Some background noise, I think. But otherwise, it's clear. Okay, let me try. Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. It's better now. Yeah. I, I put a headphone, so a uh, speakerphone, so I think it's better. Background I think. Background noise, I think. Uh, yeah, now it's okay, right? Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then I will uh, and rejoin. I mean, I will continue on the same thing. Thanks, Prashant. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, shall we start? Shelly, Shelly, Suresh, and Anand, they're ready. Yeah. Uh, sure, I'm ready. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, Anand, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, okay. Perfect. Oh. So, Dr. Uh, can you hear me, right? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, let's start. Uh, okay, again, uh, welcome back. Uh, again, a very good morning to all, all of you. Uh, we are now moving on to the, uh, the second uh, segment of the panel discussion. Uh, again, we have a very nice uh, eclectic uh, set of speakers for the second session. Uh, and uh, let me first uh, take the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, Professor Shelley Marshall. Uh, so, uh, Associate uh, Professor Shelley Marshall is the Director of the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, University, Business and Human Rights Center. Uh, this is a research center examining the human rights impact of business based at Melbourne, Australia. In uh, 2020, she was awarded a prestigious Australian Research Council Fellowship to study the potential of digital technologies to aid regulatory efforts which eliminate uh, to eliminate modern uh, slavery. She is also an RMIT Vice Chancellor's Principal Research Fellow, a cross-disciplinary scholar with degrees in political science, law, and development studies, which has allowed her to publish widely across these fields. Her research has informed labor law reform in several countries and the policies has impacted the policies of the ILO, that is the International Labor, Labor Organization under the United Nations. Uh, for example, in 2018-19, uh, uh, she made frequent trips to Thailand to advise the Thai Ministry of Labor on how to enforce labor laws for home-based workers. Shelley is a passionate supervisor of PhD students who are committed to solving sustainability and human rights problems. Uh, we are very excited to have you with us, Shelly. Uh, over to you. The floor is yours. Prashant, I am so sorry, but I think according to the running sheet, I'm going to be commentating after the next speakers. So if you could just leave me yeah. and stand by and go yeah, on yeah. to the next speaker, and then I'll be... Once we hear from the other speakers, then okay, I'll be okay. commentating and um, pulling the whole session together. Is that right, Nava? Uh, yeah, but I think you are the next speaker, actually, Shell. You, you, you are the ah. next speaker. And then it's Suresh and then it's Anand. We had a David, yeah, not able could, to. Could, uh, um, and I, I'm so sorry for doing this to proceedings, but... Uh, Suresh, is Suresh and Anand, are they giving substantial spe speeches? Yes, yes, 20 minutes each. Could I go after them then? Sorry, just because I understood that I was going to be commentating on all of the presentations rather okay. than, uh, just oh. according to the running sheet that you gave, rather okay. than giving an individual presentation. So if you could yep. come back to me, yeah, I'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then I'll, uh, I'll uh, now introduce uh, Dr. Suresh. Uh, uh, so, the, Dr. Suresh Ramakrishnan is the Deputy Dean and Associate Professor at the University of Technology in Malaysia. He's also, uh, he uh, is also the Deputy Dean uh, of the uh, University. Besides being an academic researching finance and corporate sustainability, Dr. Suresh has uh, grown his own social enterprise in Malaysia that has aided the education of children and youth from vulnerable and minority communities. 
through mentoring and fundraising programs, including gaming, gaining access to technological aids, this social enterprise has made a difference to hundreds of youth in Malaysia. I'm sure we, you know, we are very excited to uh, hear about it. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, the, uh, you're on the uh, panel now. Thank you, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Prashant. <clears throat> um, the secretary will share the slides, so I have to share the slides. I'm just wondering. Um, let me see whether I can share. Yeah, I hope you can see the slides. Yeah, yeah, your slides are visible, but you can put them on the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm doing that. I don't know what's going wrong here now. Anyway, while waiting for the slide to, to convert into a slideshow, uh, first of all, um, thank you. Um, thank you, the organizer. Oh, it's not a slideshow, it is, it is, all right, it is. Okay, so thank you, thank you to, uh, to Dr. Prashant and also the organizer. First of all, thanks for inviting me. I'm Suresh Ramakrishnan uh, from uh, Faculty of Management, uh, University Technology Malaysia. Um, special thanks to Prof. Nawa for inviting me for this session uh, on enabling technology for social impact. I think the first three speakers, they were talking on, on policies, you know, and also the implications. So I would like to just bring a case study, so-called. Um, what I have done in Malaysia uh, for the past 25 years. I've started this in 1997. Obviously, when we start, the technology component wasn't there because it's 25 years ago. Um, so, um, but recently we, we knew that uh, how important it is and then uh, we tried to embed that aspect into the project. Um, in UTM, we, we emphasize uh, specifically on social impact. Uh, UTM means it's University Technology Malaysia, which is in the south of Malaysia, uh, which is nearby to Singapore. And um, we have a center which is really focusing on the uh, community and industry networking. And therefore, um, we emphasize this special uh, team, so-called uh, Prospering Lives. So um, I do, actually, I've, um, uh, this project, as I told you, I've started 1997 uh, in a very small scale at that time. And when I was a, 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 an, an undergraduate student, you know, so we, we started this. Uh, then, obviously, once I joined university as a lecturer, then we make it in a bigger scale, right? So today's topic is a very interesting topic. And I think that the three speakers just now, they nailed it, you know, uh, it was a lot of highlighting points, but uh, what it was really uh, highlighting points for me was accessibility and affordability. I think this is also a very important issue which I experienced in this project, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, my focus was more on uh, the College of Education, uh, taking one of the part of the 17 SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we, I felt that because uh, I was focusing on the rural area. I think they, they need more support as compared to all the cities and uh, city areas and so forth. So uh, that area is the area where I came from, you know? So I thought, let, let's contribute back to the society. You know, let's contribute back to the society. So that's the reason why I went back and I thought, let's, let's help them. And I thought that the education is the fundamental. Uh, let me start something which is not related to technology and slowly get into technology because it's a 25 year story, you know? So uh, basically- Sorry, basically, sorry. So when you're yeah. trying to uh, click on the left of your screen to see if you can load your slides that way, just, you know, yeah. in your, because it'd be really nice to see the photographs. Just see uh, if you can move the slide at all. Uh, move the slides means, uh, I just can't understand. What is uh, that? Uh, meaning that? Meaning that? 
in your if you click the left hand side of your yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you should be able to move the slides that way no anyways it, it's okay sorry oh. to disturb you yeah meaning that it's not visible it is but your slides are not moving you know we, oh, we can't oh, uh, see yeah, because I, I i i am in the second uh, at the moment i'm in the second slide but we moving? can't see the second oh. slide you need to click on the second slide I've so that yes now is it moving now no, no? it's still on the first slide on my screen oh right. yeah so just see okay let me see how how about now no no the slide's it's not moving you may have to yeah share again share screen again share again huh okay hang on allow okay let's see now is it moving yes now we can see what you're saying oh, yes oh, yes okay. thank you okay. thank you all right thanks thanks for that uh, okay so um um, so as, as as I said, as I mentioned just now, it's, it's all about um, the fundamental that is the, the education and the most important is the quality of education. So that's how we started in 1987, looking into it. Then we thought that, okay, let's, let's, you know, help this group because they're the needy people and they need more support. So all the graduates went there and we tried to help them. Um, um, you see, the, the main aim of this so-called social enterprise, we call it as the NGO, a non okay NGO. So um, we we established this, and the name Geranto is is the suburbs. You know, it's a it's a rural area. Of course, now we can see some developments taking place. I'm talking about 25 years ago. So what we did, we we created, uh, we developed this uh, NGO, so called Geranto Indian Academy Club. So we we thought of we need to focus these two students as to make sure we shape their attitude and also academic and try to produce as a future-oriented graduate. So obviously, you know, we want them to be future-oriented. So uh, among those uh, school students, and uh, obviously uh, we were strongly supported by um, some other NGOs, temples, and so forth. So we we're focusing on uh, one of the sample that is the Indian students. And um, we wanted to motivate and, uh, you know, and to try to, to create inner strength among them. And on top of that, we, we also actually want, we felt that the main, uh, I mean, one of the reasons is also in terms of the financial assistance. They have some issues. They have some, okay, they were facing some financial burden. So therefore we created a special fund. What I would like to highlight here is basically in terms of the quadruple helix collaborations that we created 25 years ago, that time we didn't know about what is quadruple. But anyway, we thought that we can't do it alone. So we wanted to make sure the students have all those facilities, including the technology facilities. But that time was very basic, as I'm talking about 97. Um, but we can't do it alone and we need some support. And you know, this recalls me at what the three speakers say just now uh, in terms of smart partnership, you know? So um, what we did uh, initially, we didn't have a good support, uh, only one or two were helping us. The society was helping us. Then later on, we thought that if we want to make sure the students to have the complete facility, then including all those gadgets, you know, related to, to technology and so forth, we need other strong collaborators. And therefore we try to seek to those industries. And that was the turning point where the fund uh, were coming in slowly in a bigger amount and we could raise a very good amount basically and to to facilitate and to try to to you know to help the students and give them more uh, not only in the technology per se but also in other factors you know other facilities to make sure that the students you know have a good facility but not to all the students we do look into uh, we try to uh, do some survey you know whether uh, it, are they affordable? Are they not affordable? So basically, we targeted uh, the bottom 40, you know, we call it B40 uh, families, and we try to assist them in terms of this kind of facilities to make sure that they're not left behind. So um, we felt that, you know, um, during that time, we were not talking about internet. You see, the turning point of internet came um, very, I would say, seriously after the COVID. COVID has taken a great lesson to us, right? 
So pre, I, I'm very sure because I think those developed countries, internet is one of the fundamental, you know, uh, but, but then I don't think so in the developing countries, but the turning point was after the COVID, you know, everybody realized that, oh my God, we need internet at home. Before that, you know, it, it was not a necessity. So that was a turning point. And then everybody realized that, you know, they need to assess to that. Then these two terms comes into their mind, accessibility and affordability. Obviously, the accessibility wasn't that good because it's a rural area. And uh, the affordability of definitely will come into the second question. Whether, even though if it is accessibility, are you afford to, do, to buy that or to purchase that? So these are two important factors, you know, always coming into their mind. So, but however, we try to we try to proceed on this. But what was the great part in this project? We created the mindset. That 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 was the first thing. We created the mindset, the importance of uh, education and also uh, the technology. That's how the social impact comes into the picture. Whenever we start the program, we always talk about the, the advancement of technology. We always try to embed that into their mindset to tell them, because we are talking about future-oriented graduates. And you cannot put aside this the word technology. How are you going to be a future-oriented graduate when you don't even put the element of technology into the office? into the whole scenario. That's how the goal and the mindset thing comes into in each and every year of the program where the program starts of the goal and mindset. Thing. Obviously, we also talk about other issues and we try to try to, you know, uh, the methodology, the approach of the program was trying to bring in the technology issues. You see, um, you see, even though you have accessibility, even though you have affordability, you must know about technology. There's another issue. This is another part of the, the part of the coin, another side of the coin. You know, uh, you can assess your effort, but there is no knowledge about it. This is another issue. Sometimes you don't even know what is about it. Uh, of course, nowadays youth are quite advanced, you know, but sometimes they're left behind in certain uh, aspects. So we try to embed this, you know, before 2020. But uh, slowly, you know, you know, nowadays generations are totally different than those days generations. They're very fast moving people. Of course, they have the handphones and they can do that. But you can't do everything using your handphones. Sometimes the phones are not that advanced and they can't afford to buy the advanced smartphones. You know, but however, what our role was to embed the importance of technology from day one. And we try to educate the primary and the secondary school students on that, right? And uh, those activities, besides some face-to-face -face activities, you know, uh, some normal activities, teamwork activities, we also conduct some technology-based activities where they have to use their handphones, you know, if we educate them, you know, how to, you know, we will uh, specifically, uh, this kind of activities were, was very impactful after 2020, because we have no choice, we have to do the, the, the workshops, the seminar uh, through online. So that, that was the good turning point where we educate them the importance of technology and how and most of the activities was conducted online. So they were enjoying and they were learning how to use that, you know. So this is the very important change that we could create among them, right? And, um, you know, um, creating uh, directions is very important for the young people, you know, especially students, you know, uh, especially the primary and also the secondary school students before they go into their tertiary educations. So we try to create, um, you know, uh, those directions, try to embed uh, all kind of values into them, you know, and uh, obviously the technology comes into the picture during the sessions, you know, we try to always remember and remind them about it. And uh, you see, um, there's no point only talking to the students, uh, they'll be very excited, you know, for the whole day or might be for two, three days and then jumping and dancing. And once they go home, they get into the house, everything is gone. So we thought that 
don't only focus on the students and we try to also focus on the parents. No point talking to the students that the importance of technology, this and that, when the parents are also uh, don't know anything about it. You know, you must understand it's a rural place. Of course, we have educated people over there, not to say we are not in back in 1920s. But however, what we can see here, we have different groups of parents. And there's them, there might be some educated parents, uh, and over some will be low education and so forth. So for them, they're not very used, you know, to, to use all these sort of gadgets and so forth. They don't have that knowledge of technology. So this is I'm talking about besides accessibility and affordability. I think one of the speakers just now was highlighting about uh, the education of technology is also important. If you don't even know how to use that, then there's no point of coming up with that policy. So the, the education part is very important in, in, in bringing in technology towards social impact. You know, so, um, so we try to bring them into for in our programs where you can see in the picture where the parents involved in the sessions where we also discuss about these kind of issues. You know how technology. Uh, basically, we also talk about the good and the bad. You know sometimes that also divert the students into a bad pathway. So we always wanted the parents to be the guardians and to make sure that. Let, let them also know about the importance of technology and the good and the bad thing of the technology. And what is their role as a parents to make sure that this, their kids should have those facilities, you know, and that will help them to, to progress well in their education. So uh, for those uh, unaffordable parents, then we would like to meet them separately and then we try to help them, try to provide financial assistance. And uh, probably we can help them in purchasing those things you know, uh, those gadgets and um, um, not to all for those needy people, because sometimes people can just misuse and just say that, oh, I'm B40 or B20 and they create their own standards. So we will do a proper survey and then we try to help them in a proper way. But here, when I talk about collaboration, it's not only bringing the collaboration in terms of financial, but the one of the stakeholders for me, I felt that the parents are also one of the important stakeholders in this scenario because they will be with the students all the while and they are a very important person in the whole model. So therefore, they need to have that kind of mindset, not only the students have the mindset, the parents have to have the mindset, then the whole house will have the same mindset. Then you can see some changes. You see, the social impact will be only uh, applicable and successful if, if every, if, if let's see, if, if let's say I'm focusing a student, then if the parent is not in the model, then how are you going to make it successful? So therefore, you have to make sure you have to bring them into the model. Then, then you can see some changes, right? Me. So, yeah. Yes, Prof. Nava, anything? Uh, just a, a few more minutes, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going towards the end. So um, uh, we, we believe that uh, awards and recognition is always is the best way to motivate someone. So therefore, uh, we do uh, recognize and, 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 and know and uh, we give awards to all those successful students. And the beauty of this project is once they have graduated, you know, we train them from primary to secondary and we impart and then we try to embed and we train them in terms of technology and so forth until they go to university, they join us into this program, they contribute back and, you know, we create a new society, a graduate society in that suburb. And uh, so far we have produced more than 100 graduates for the past hundreds of graduates for the past 20 years, 25 years. And for the past two, three years, the programs are more on online. We're also going to do face-to-face. -face. It's going to be hybrid anyway. And we can see students are getting into it. They're getting into this zone of technology and they could see uh, how important is technology and we can uh, actually uh, create a bigger impact to students. But at the moment, what we felt that uh, the two component that the accessibility is almost there in that sub suburb, but affordability is not there, but not a very big group. We are also focusing on this group and we hope that the entire community will get into the zone, uh, come into the zone and they can get the full um, benefit out of this program. So I think that's all from my side, a simple project <laughs> and not a big project. Anyway, but um, for me, we could see a big impact uh, for the past 25 years. Thank you. The pass to you. Okay. 
you you can stop sharing uh, the slide. Yeah, I also try. Oh, to... I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I know I have tried. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Suresh, uh, for a very interesting project uh, that you have done. Uh, so uh, let me just now invite the next speaker, Mr. Anand Desai, prog program manager education from the IT for Change. Uh, so IT for Change has done very very highly impactful work in India. Uh, especially in school and teacher education, uh, uh, and uh, IT for Change is a special consultate has got a special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Uh, this NGO aims for a society in which digital technologies contribute to human rights, social justice, and equity. Uh, Anand provides guidance on the development and maintenance of the cloud infrastructure, as well as the program management activities of IT for Change. He has varied experience in solution architecture, program delivery, and implementation of IT solutions to solve complex business problems for various customers across the globe. He has been in the IT industry for over 25 years, an engineer by qualification, and an IT person by profession, he has always been passionate about uh, improving the quality of education. We have had a very good interaction with the IT for Change uh, and the founders and, you know, uh, we have seen firsthand uh, a lot of policy inputs given uh, to various bodies of the government of India. Uh, over to you, Anand. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Prashant. Yeah, we are able to hear you. Uh, Can you please load up the presentation? I had sent it in the morning. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Can you please load up the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Arvind, uh, can you load it? Presentation. I had sent a presentation in the morning. Can yeah, you please? Yeah, yeah. We'll just load it. Yeah, Arvind. Yeah. Uh, while the presentation gets loaded, uh, yeah. good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll wait while it gets loaded. Uh, good morning once again to all the co-panelists as well as all the other people who are uh, joining in this webinar discussion. And I, I believe some people are joined in on the live stream on YouTube as well, for giving us this opportunity to be part of this wonderful session today and to hear uh, some excellent uh, thoughts and uh, you know insights from our uh, esteemed panelists. So I would like to, uh, and like uh, Dr. Prashant said, I am part of an NGO called IT for Change Technology to bring about social change. So we work in a few areas uh, uh, across gender, uh, internet governance, education, women empowerment, and community informatics. And uh, uh, Dr. Prashant, any issues in loading up this thing? No, actually. Can I load it myself or what? No, I think you can load it. We don't seem yeah. to have received it. Uh, we can load it on your own, I think. Yeah. I said, okay. I'll try to do that. Hold on. Share screen. I have to do a share screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, full screen. One second. I'll do it myself. Uh, uh, no. Not in on this, sorry. Can you see my screen now, Dr. Prashant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see the screen now. We can see, yeah. Hello? Yeah, you can, we can see. Yeah, the okay. Screen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, sorry for that uh, brief uh, technical uh, difficulty. So let's continue. So as I just said, I we work in a multiple areas, including uh, gender, women empowerment, community informatics, and uh, internet governance. And today, I would like to talk to you. I uh, would like to share our experience in uh, transforming school education uh, with technology integration. Uh, we believe uh, school education is uh, extremely important um, in not only building the society but also in building the in bringing about the change in uh, society. So our earlier panelists, uh, Dr. I think uh, Mr. Um, one of them, uh, you know, um, uh, explained challenges about affordability and accessibility, particularly in rural areas. Uh, I'll try and uh, also uh, touch upon 
how we are try to address these aspects uh, in particularly in, in our programs okay so when we talk about ict uh, now ICT meaning information community fundamental thing that we need to look at when it comes to education is you know uh, there should be uh, knowledge should be shared freely without any restrictions so when you, when you talk about free sharing of knowledge then obviously the uh, affordability comes into picture how many people can really afford the proprietary software that is there be it uh, microsoft or apple or google or whatever it is right so that's where uh, we uh, you know strongly believe and advocate use of open technologies we use only free and open source software which basically means uh, uh, um so satantra uh, uh, or azure software basically when you say free and open is different than free uh, of cost you know we all know that we use email services like gmail or uh, video services like youtube they are all free of cost but they are not free and open they are not fast services right we all know the dangers that are there in the proprietary software so when it comes to education we strongly believe that we only should use free and open source software uh, this movement started in us in the early 80s but picked up in india only in the early 2000s uh, with kerala leading the uh, charge and today quite a few states particularly southern states have also started using it and in fact, the ncert ict policy 2012 and the ict curriculum also ref- recommend use of uh, free and uh, you know uh, open source software so when you use free and open source software and create content which also is free and open it means there is no licensing inf- issues or there is no copyright issues or there is no commercial implications that's where i think uh, you know we will use the double get the double benefit of uh, really having uh, you know the software and the resources available to everybody across the spectrum of the society so basically we we uh, in our programs with teachers uh, we always uh, train to create their own content and license it as free and open so we, uh, our endeavor is to always strengthen the teacher agency and move them away from just being consumers of technology to also being our co-creators and you know that thereby also publish it to the rest of them that's what they so when you do open education resource right uh, basically it gives you four freedoms it can be accessed and for free and reused it can be revised it can also be be modified and it can be redistributed so as long as you licensing it should be we should be able to do uh, execute all these four uh, freedoms which are called four r's that you see on the slide so we research is available in the internet and not only access also create their own resources contextualize them to their classrooms and then uh, uh, you know uh, share right when it comes to teachers but we don't just work with teachers we basically work with the, the entire all the stakeholders within the education system from students teachers administrators parents and the community so all five uh, stakeholders we cover so i'll uh, briefly touch upon uh, what uh, you know how we are uh, you know using, uh, how uh, our programs are able to make a difference so when you look at f- f- free and open source right a lot of uh, there is a lot of skepticism saying you know i can do so many things in uh, uh, proprietary technology but i'll not have a corresponding equivalent in free and open source world which is not really true because there are uh, at least from when it comes to education there are uh, a host of applications which are available in the fast world which can be used for creating documents spreadsheets uh, or searches or even hundreds of fast educational applications available to reach teach various subjects for be it mathematics science geography history um, you know chemistry any of the languages any of those things even a webinar platform like the one that we are using is zoom even that has a free and open source counterpart called big blue button which we use very extensively so the reason i'm harping on this free and open source is primarily because we talk about affordability right and when we are talking about working in a education in public education system in india affordability is a big issue not just in rural india even in urban settings even in metro of like bangalore when you go to government uh, schools uh, both accessibility and affordability becomes a big challenge so the reason we that's the reason why we always uh, you know um, we always uh, emphasize on leveraging free and open source software 
So, so when you use free and open source applications along with the open educational resources, that basically creates a rich uh, teaching learning environment, which basically does not uh, provide any, uh, does not uh, limit in any uh, teachers or any students from accessing software because there are no commercial implications, because there are no licensing or copyright issues. So it is fairly it is easily accessible. As long as you have a device, it's getting accessible. In fact, uh, you might wonder that you know, uh, accessibility is such an issue, but then we also have made sure that some of these resources and quite a few of these applications are available in offline mode. It means you don't even need internet to access and use them. So as long as a school has even a single computer, which most of the schools in, uh, at least in urban settings in, Karnata, in a state like Karnataka have, we can still leverage this because you don't even need a uh, internet connection as well. And today, quite a few of the teachers, at least, if not students, quite a few teachers also use smartphones. So quite a few of these applications can also be used in some smartphone, again, in offline mode as well, so which again uh, enables them to uh, you know, use and uh, uh, use these applications, uh, uh, integrate them into their teaching learning without having to be dependent on internet. So that's something we are looking at. Uh, and so um, combined to this, what we also do is uh, uh, we, we adopt the, the technological pedagogical content knowledge framework, which was uh, uh, you know, piloted by Professor Pundya Mishra some time back. And what it basically means is that uh, uh, the legacy methods of teaching are, not, are inadequate, at least in today's context, particularly where students are, uh, you know, have a different uh, learning uh, needs. They have come from different backgrounds. They come from different socio-economic, uh, cultural, or linguistic backgrounds in a place like a uh, uh, metro place like Bangalore. So they definitely need to have a different ways of doing this thing. So our programs are not just another ICT programs. We use ICT basically to disrupt the legacy models and to provide different alternatives rather than just depending on only the textbooks, which are typically centrally decided, not really contextual in a remote place or something like that, right? So that's something we are using and we are, our focus is always on digital tools, uh, teaching methods. So our model basically, uh, you know, uh, talks about uh, not just teachers, but also we also, uh, uh, you know, engage with student teachers. Basically, these are the people who are undergoing the two year and the four year BA programs in uh, in India who will become teachers after completion of programs, as well as teacher educators who, who basically train these teachers. So net net, when you engage with all the stakeholders, it enables our work to scale and sustain. And, uh, and the teachers then go on to sustain uh, their work. So that has a network effect. Similarly, we also don't just do one program. We try to create communities of learning. And they say, when you try to create a community of learning through virtual forums, be it WhatsApp group, or Telegram group, or email group earlier before WhatsApp Telegram became uh, very um, you know, uh, prevalent in India. So that's something also is basically helps us to sustain our programs even after we complete our engagement. And then um, we already talked about uh, FOSS and OER. I will not touch upon that again. And the most important part, which is what the last part is, you know, we are, uh, we are, uh, are there are other NGOs also working in the education area, but we are going to only make a difference to a smaller set of schools or smaller set of students, but uh, on our own. So that's the reason why we always work with education systems and societies and also work within the government um, structures because we can leverage the uh, government uh, uh, resources, both the monetary resources and the human resources so that our effect is um, amplified you know to a larger scale and it can be it can really impact children at a much larger scale so uh, this being the model and we've had a fair amount of success in the last 10 11 years uh, that we are working with uh, public education systems we are focusing more of our work in uh, karnataka in uh, south india but we also have uh, worked in a few other states across uh, india so i'll briefly uh, talk about uh, two such programs the first two i'll talk about how exactly we have done that and what exactly we have done and how it has impacted Mr. the uh, students and you know yeah Desai, yes madam if we can wrap up in the next five minutes that would be great thank you yeah i will do that okay yeah okay. i'll only talk about the first two programs here not the other things yeah so one of the programs that we have been doing since 2017 which is about six years running now is what is we call teachers community of learning where even we use uh, we train teachers to uh, use education software applications to teach uh, mathematics, science, English, and Canada. 
and they also give, give them a platform to peer learn and to you know engage with parents and communities most of the children in our government schools are uh, first time school goers so the parents may not be even literate so we use technology like ivrs to reach out to the parents as well so this is what you see here is an example of uh, a teacher in, in uh, integrating technology uh, for teaching mathematics because mathematics is uh, is usually seen as a uh, difficult subject so that uh, uh, this makes it much more easier and for uh, students to uh, you know understand the concept and try it on their own similarly what you see here is a simulation of a science uh, experiment uh, a physical experiment versus vis-a-vis -vis the digital experience how it can be simulated and when it comes to languages right this what you see here on the uh, uh, on the screen are uh, students trying to create picture stories uh, stories we using the uh, pictures as well as the uh, digital media as well as a, a teacher creating audio stories for teaching language you know because it's prose or poetry so all these are technology programs that we conduct and another aspect we are doing is digital storytelling wherein we try to community connect the community institutions for documenting live social science learning so we take students to various community institutions like library post office police station rto etc and they interact with officials come back and they take photos create stories of that come back and present that's what you see here and this is something we have seen students being really very actively participating and making uh, you know uh, learning lot of skills along with the team work collaborative skills and etc the teach this is an example of teachers continuing their uh, learning sharing even after this thing and this continuity of learning happens over uh, whatsapp moodle lms or over emails as well okay so the other program i just briefly highlight is the program we did with the government of karnataka between 2011 to 16 wherein we trained uh, about uh, 20 uh, about we trained about 20000 plus science maths and social science teachers uh, across 5000 schools it was a five year program across state in done in collaboration with karnataka government this is why i said you know we have, we collaborate we work within the government system so that the scale of impact is much higher and uh, this was before the whatsapp became very popular so a lot of people were uh, sharing ideas through emails so this other thing we talked about so uh, just to wind up i'll just uh, just our uh, uh you know just a vision and vision i'd like to once again thank uh, c20 uh, working committee for giving us this opportunity happy to answer any questions thank you thank you thank you very much uh, mr desai a uh, very very uh, you know it, we would have loved to have had more time to listen because this digital solution uh, what it calls storytelling etc the work you are doing is um, definitely leveraging um technology um for, you know you can see the benefits flowing through um so shall i now pass the baton on to um shelly to now thank take you it, take over and i'm so shelly. i'm so sorry about earlier no um, but no, i that's hope okay. that i I hope that I can provide um some comments and to summarize the conversation so far uh, so far to lead on to a conversation if we have time for Q&As. Yes. So yes. in terms of highlighting the findings or highlighting um the commentary today all speakers told us about the power of digital technologies and the digital revolution for social impact and its potential to attain the sustainable development goals and the reasons for that are because of its speed its geographical reach its population reach um its potential to enhance civil engagement and because it has the potential to give greater access to business government resources and and to knowledge and i think you know all of our speakers have highlighted this to us however all of our speakers have warned us about accessibility connectivity quality and equality risks so we heard for example from apoorv about um the in incredible risks entailed in uh not sorry dr prashant no um in 
in not targeting or not designing uh, technologies for different um, abilities. We heard about um, the problems that arise when they're not designed with the poor in mind, when they're designed for, uh, for or, or in richer countries, and when they're not um, designed or targeted for um, the poor, when they don't reach um, geographically remote people, and even when they do reach, when there is accessibility, when the quality of that connectivity is not high enough. Um, we heard about the problems with not accounting for oral cultures and different cultures of use. I think what we didn't hear very much about was gender. And what I would like to lead us um, into a conversation about is the really important issue of accessibility based on gender and how design and, um, and use can take into account differences in gender, um, gender usage and accessibility more. So I flag that as a really important point for further conversation. I, um, am, I feel so inspired by the solutions that have been spoken about in the course of the last two hours. Many of those, I believe, provide lessons for government policies, for regional agreements, um, and also for industry agree agreements and codes. So we heard, for example, about the importance of incentives and subsidies for the creation of Indigenous production and invention. Um, so we heard about the problems of production or invention occurring in the economic north, um, making products far more expensive and not targeted to the uses of um, the countries where most products are actually being used because that's where the greatest population on earth is. I would add to that a problem, not just of production invention, but also of testing. So what we see in the, in the research is the importance of testing of new um, technologies, both at the concept phase to find out whether there's actually a desire, whether there's a need, whether it will be used at the concept phase and also at the prototyping phase of um, of invention and development, both on specific cultures, on different ag agendas, and also people of different abilities. That means that we don't have to do this backtracking later to try to make them more accessible, but rather that accessibility is built into their design. And I think that's a really important um, lesson from today's um, session. One of the things that wasn't raised, but I think comes back to this, the importance of indigenous um, production invention is diversity, diversity of employment um, in technology companies. And there's so much data that shows that when you have white males in the economic north um, coming up with design, then that skews the nature of what's being produced. And I think there's a really important role for government and for industry agreements in shaping employment and ensuring that there is diversity um, at the point of employment and the point of, the point of um, concept, design, testing, prototyping at every stage. We heard briefly about the power of procurement, of public procurement, um, the power of public buying. Um, this is an area where there can be really strong mandates about accessibility not just um, uh, to ensure um, that there's wider use, but also that use um, enhances social impact and, S and the SDGs. So we can bake that into the design. Um, we heard that there needs to be greater alignment between technology developments, regulators and users. And I think where we're gonna move next is where can this conversation go? How do we bring together these different parties in policy um, dialogue? Um, 
we, our last two speakers provided us with so much food for thought and great case studies about the importance of education and the way that education occurs. So that means education of teachers, first of all. And our last speaker told us about the importance of that or, and how it can occur. Um, the idea of ICT for teaching rather than teaching about ICT. The importance of making learning ICT fun for students, education for all um, ages and education of parents as well. So, and, and again, the data shows this, that the, this education needs to occur not just in schools, but one of the reasons that um, so many technologies, digital technologies aren't being used by diverse populations is they don't know about them, they don't know how to use them, or they feel intimidated by them, even if they can afford them, or they're, they're, they're accessible in other ways. So there's so much work to be done there. Finally, we heard about the importance of state provision not just of accessible technologies, but also alternatives. I think we need to recognize the limitations of digital technologies. Um, and we had the analogy, for example, um, of the importance of buses compared with say trains. You might be building a metro system, you still need, um, you still need buses. The same goes for digital technologies. And I think um, coming back to this importance of indigenous production and invention, um, having a focus on frugal technologies, um, thinking about the fact that most of the capabilities of say phones, so many of the technologies we use are redundant. You know, most people only use about 10% of the um, capabilities. So what do we really need to provide and how can, can we produce um, uh, both physical technologies and digital technologies that are going to drive development? I wanna thank all the speakers for these um, amazing and inspiring ideas and um, also to the organizers of this fantastic dialogue and hand you over to our chairs for a conversation about all of these amazing points. So thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, that was very, as usual, your eloquent self in summarizing, you know, the day's discussions. Uh, I'd like to add to that, I think when we talk about diversity, uh, we do talk a lot about gender or more so now uh, people with the, uh, disabilities. So, um, but we don't talk enough about, I think, age, because when it comes to technology, you know, uh, and, you know, the, and I really liked Suresh's um, uh, point about parents. You can't just say, you know, throw this technology at kids. And they're not, you know, the value-based, you know, system needs to be there to support the use of technology as well, which is another, you know, area that the um, TST working group is uh, very interested in. Um, and soon we'll hear a little bit more about TSD from my co-chair uh, of the area, uh, Dr. Krishna Shri. Um, but I think the age is also when it comes to technology that we need to uh, perhaps have another, you know, uh, course of discussions over. Um, can I just ask, I know you do wonderful work with minority workers and, you know, the, basically, the digitized workplace. For you, what would be um, a critical policy development that needs, I mean, what are the risks? And then what are the a critical policy or set of policies that needs to be developed? Digital workplace. So, um, I mean, I think we're all aware of the way that digitization of employment is changing the labor force. And I think, you know, we often think of that um, in relation to, say, Uber drivers or delivery workers. But in fact, it's far, far broader than that. So in the research that I've been doing in India, for example, you know, we see digitization um, in relation to um, domestic work. Mm -hmm. um, 
so and 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 there i think you know we need to recognize that it is um transforming work for women because there's so much focus on gig work that's male um in terms of um i guess one of the single biggest solutions that i would see um it's that um calculations of minimum wages um and also um of um i mean of, of any wage um and because you know we're speaking today with many indians and there there's often sectoral um uh wage setting it has to take into account the cost of access to technology mm. and at the moment it's not so for mm. example the calculation of the minimum wage in most states doesn't take into account the cost of a smartphone but mm. most work actually you know so much work today depends on having access um to a smartphone yeah so you know there there's so much else um that i could say about that but that would be my you know one really big takeaway um that the cost of wages has to take into account access to digital technologies because so much revolves around that now Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, if the rest of the panel members would also like to add in to uh, discuss or, or reveal or, you know, share what are some critical policy changes that, you know, you see are being painful for you, for example, even in the digitized education, you know, area, uh, Anand and Suresh, you know, in delivering, I mean, from a small, you know, you, you, I know you're very humble, but uh, you, you've done fantastic work in Malaysia. You've made a uh, change, you know, a difference to not only individuals, but the whole family, you know, the whole family structure. So, but what sort of policies do you see, you know, needing to come out, say in a Malaysian context or Indian context? Um, Mr. Anand? Uh, thank you. I'm gonna talk about policy, but I'll definitely I'll try to uh, talk about what can governments do, particularly in the context of uh, edu public education in an in, in Indian context. You know, uh, way back in 1966, I think uh, the Kutari Commission said the, the six percent of uh, nine we are still nowhere near that, and year on year we we see that both the central and the state governments are reducing the budget allocation on education. Yeah. And after COVID, when it became even more important uh, that you know uh, that there should be more funds uh, channeled towards education, actually it has gone on other way around. Most of the state governments are reduced in education. Uh, I mean, we means public government investment in education. The last mile of connect governments, we, we our appeal is to that at least. They have to ensure that education remains a priority, and uh, you know that they spend uh, uh, adequately on that. That is one. Second, we have seen uh, post-pandemic, at least in Indian context, is that there are a lot of people who are dropped out of schools, either because of uh, child labor or because of uh, early marriages, uh, you know, or because of sheer poverty or sheer migration. Labors are migrated back to the states. So that's again uh, something which is very conscious. I mean, we are not seeing that even after one year. Um, there is no conscious effort or no conscious policy at the state or the central level to address this. Uh, what are we, or what I would like to term as an education emergency. You know, everyone there are policies to uh, uh, address the financial part, uh, the policies to address the health uh, impact of COVID, but there is no conscious effort or no conscious policies uh, to address the COVID impact on the education, which something is definitely a dire need because uh, that's something students we see on the ground. Students are suffering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Suresh. Would you like to add? A final remark? Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, in, in terms of Malaysia, I think the, um, in terms of, um, I can see that in Malaysia, they are really focusing on that, uh, where they are giving some, some special, what do you call it, um, internet, home internet packages, which is very low, you know, uh, to 
to the citizens. So I think that that is one of the one of the way to make sure that you know to bring in all people to involve in this. And because uh, when, when you talk about affordability, sometimes you know if the internet is too expensive, of course they cannot. You know you cannot be using your handphone internet. You need home internet. Then you can create that environment at home. You know, and in um, in addition, you can see that. Uh, the government is also providing uh, laptops to the B40 families. Mm -hmm. So the NGOs are trying to be the mediator between the government and also the people and trying to make sure that these people, the B40 people, gets the laptops. So with the internet package and the laptop, I believe that, um, you know, there'll be greater impact. So these two things is really materializing. And I'm so attracted with one of the speakers just now. He said that government should not approve budgets for entertainment, this kind of pro programs, but might as well uh, give more budgets, you know, allocations for uh, projects and programs that educate more the importance of technology, internet, and so forth to the society, you know, give more allocation on that kind of programs. So I think that will be, a, will be an eye opener and we can change the mindset and bring, and then we can see a better and a greater social impact into the society. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Um, so, um, I, I, Aproof, would you like to say any final remark? This is final remarks from the speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of uh, remarks. Uh, first, I'd just maybe like add, I'd like to add on to what Shelley had mentioned earlier in terms of getting platform economy. Uh, we do extensive research in this space. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, along with uh, uh, several other priority areas in this space, I think looking at effective social security infrastructure is need of the hour. Um, at the same time, we have to uh, develop indigenous solutions. See. Up until now, the labor conversation, the labor constructs have really been shaped by the global north, where the, the structure is really different. So, you know, in the global north, you have 90 to almost 80 to 90 percent of people in formal economy in India and uh, uh, rest of the developing world. This is exactly turned uh, in India, for instance, we have 92 percent of informal economy. And uh, therefore, we need to come up with our own measures uh, to protect and uh, empower uh, the gig workers and at the same time we have to be careful that this cannot uh, uh, be disproportionately increasing the cost of doing business because the new and upcoming platforms the ones that are starting up from a garage with two uh, founders and a dog uh, for them this can be a question of survival right so we have to be really cognizant of that really balanced in terms of taking uh, various stakeholders together and working towards the betterment of the ecosystem at large so that's, that's probably, you know, uh, first uh, uh, input. On the second front, um, I actually uh, am of the opinion that we as policymakers, as influencers need to aim high today. Uh, till now, we've been speaking about equal participation of access, um, uh, which are important enough itself. But, uh, you know, if you look around, People are getting inspired, and and uh, you know, large uh, uh, action is being taken when big audacious goals are set. Be it uh, becoming a five trillion or ten trillion dollar economy here in India or globally, uh, you know, uh, from from other parts of the world, setting up uh, habitation on Mars. We need uh, we need imagination of that scale, and therefore, uh, in our space, what we need to do is not just uh, you know like figure out how do we. How do we educate the next uh, bunch of students, uh, which yeah. is important, no doubt at all, but create leaders, leaders who are going to be at the forefront, who are going to be able to create that innovations coming from space of uh, people with disabilities, uh, LGBTQ, women, and really empower them to set up that. So set them up for success, set up that pipeline. So we need something like that. And yes. uh, I think yes. all of that will come together. Wonderful, thank you, uh, thank you, Booth. Couldn't agree with you more. And and very final words, Rafi. If you, Rafi, I can't see you. Hi, sure. Final well, words. Yes, yeah. sure. Well, Professor Shelley summed it up rather brilliantly. The nuances are mm -hmm. very much complex, and yes, education is truly the key for us to make sure that this is technology yeah. 
is in the mainstream. And hopefully once they have the grasp of uh, the knowledge of technology, we should be able to also communicate how they're able to con uh, protect themselves. Okay. Digital security is really at the forefront. And especially when it comes to vulnerable groups, journalistic groups you know, that want to voice out opinions that might not be popular for everyone. But to close Nava, this discussion really does sum up what the hashtag of the C20G20 is. You are the light. So hopefully yes. this working group can become the light that can serve yes. and help the blind spots for technology, security, and transparency. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rafi. And with that, on that wonderful, beautiful note, I'll hand over to uh, or invite uh, my two esteemed um, colleagues, co-chairs uh, co of the uh, uh, TSD working group uh, in under C20, that is Dr. Krishnashri and Ms. Allison Richards. Allison is actually in US. And we're just hoping she's uh, still awake. Hi, <laughs> Krishna Shri, Alison. Are you there, Alison? You poor thing. Yes, I'm still here, still awake. Krishna Shri, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, basically, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, I would really like to thank our very distinguished speakers today for really shedding important, uh, you know, highlights on you know, many specific things we discussed today, um, including accessibility, affordability, availability um, um, of technology, and how we should really present this as, uh, you know, areas of improvement that the entire G20 set of countries should take forward. I think we will continue to involve each of you in really articulating these into specific action-oriented items. I know that we all care about the world in a very important way, but you know, it is also equally important to, con to, to convert our thoughts and ideas into something that is tangible, that is really practical, um, where we are really involved on the field to be able to suggest uh, you know, such uh, perhaps modifications to existing mm -hmm. policies. I think we were also very well represented uh, uh, in today's <coughs> panel, looking at developed countries, developing economies, uh, a very good balanced uh, panel um, as well today. We also have many important areas that are yet um, under discussion and to be discussed. Would love to have your support in um, connecting us to all the key people that are involved and not only in technology for empowerment, but looking at AI and data for society, looking at disinformation, um, trust, uh, transparency, security, safety, and resilience, uh, ultimately. So I think these are also uh, very, very important for this um, working group. We do have a tall order in being able to reach out to the entire world and, and really suggest what are the some best policies. So we really seek all of your help, uh, all the attendees, all the speakers in this uh, novel endeavor to be able to suggest uh, what we feel are the best for um, all the civil society organizations. So with that, I'd really like to thank each of you, my entire team that has supported this event um, and also the upcoming events. And now I'd like to request um, Alison Richards, my co-coordinator, international coordinator to also speak a few words. Thank you, Krishna Shri. Uh, what I would like to do is just say that I was very impressed with everyone's uh, presentations here today. You guys were very, very compelling and touched on so many different topics. And uh, as you know, this technology security and transparency is a very large area. And as uh, Dr. Krishna Shri mentioned, you know, for us to write a policy that's going to be succinct and uh, something that we can actually get down to the amount of words that we have to recommend to the G20, it's gonna be a big undertaking because this is such a vast area, you know, AI, ethics, privacy, cyber, all of that. So we have a number of things that are coming up and we would love, as Krishna Sri mentioned, for you to participate like folks have today with some um, actual exchange of ideas coming in 
and presenting what you guys are doing, talking about case studies that have been successful in one country that could potentially be replicated in other countries that we can highlight up on our website and we can potentially take forth to the G20. And so we have a number of um, forums that we're gonna be hosting that's called Policy Week from March 6th through the 11th. And as you can see here, some is gonna be around AM data, you know, there would be around ethics and disinformation and transparency and trust, security, safety, and resilience, um, also technology for empowerment. And I think that whole empowerment for children, for women, you know, you, you can go a number of angles. So what would be great is if you can get the word out about these events that are coming up and also encourage other CSOs, other NGOs, and also write a little policy brief so that you could submit something of about 300 words. And then if you have case studies that we can share as well, then we can profile some of those up on the webpage, but we can also have you present this and speak in breakouts about what should be the policy recommendation. At the end of the day, that's what we're doing as a C20 is giving a recommendation to the G20. And um, since this is such a vast topic, we do need a lot of help and we'd love you to get all countries represented, all organizations that you know about, and please you know, share information about the events and also participate. So the other area is um, we have upcoming events here and I'll give you a link so that you can go and, and see where to find that and register, but many will be webinars. So you can do them from wherever you are. Uh, we will have a big event. It's an international conference, May 13th through 14th. It's a two day summit and that will take place in Coimbatore. And we are looking for um, great speakers to also join us there. So if you have some ideas on that, we'd, we'd appreciate your collaboration on that. We can't do this on our own, as we said, this is something that we'd really you know, like to work with all of you on. Um, so let me go to this next slide, one second. It's not advancing, so let's see. I might have to stop my share and move it one down one second. Sorry about that. There you go. So this is our website. It's c20.ama.org and it's for the Technology Security and Transparency Group. If you can go there, that's an area where you could submit your policy thought their links. You can also showcase uh, any case studies. These are these udaharans. And if they've been done successfully in one country, there might be something that other countries can benefit from. So that would be really useful. Register with the C20 and with us as well so that you can you know, get contacted about upcoming events and things like that. And then please come to any events that you know seem like they would be in your area of expertise and invite other folks as well. So with that, I'll just turn it back over to Dr. Nava and she can do the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, and you know, um, it's been absolutely a wonderful enlightening in, in, and has met our expectations in every way. Um, the conversations have been inspirational. I thank everyone who has participated. And in particular, I would say another big, big thank you to our panel speakers um, uh, in no specific order, except that we have written on this paper, <laughs> Ms. Um, uh, Professor um, Shelley Marshall, Mr. Osama Manza, Apoof Kulkani, Mr. Rafi, Seth, uh, Professor Suresh uh, from UTM, and also Mr. Anand Desai, uh, as well as uh, Prashan, thank you. There's a, there's a village of people at the back of this, uh, how this event occurred today. Uh, and uh, they have been an absolute wonderful team. I could not ask for a more uh, better team. And thank you so much, everyone. And love working with uh, Krishna Shri and Allison. We want to. We would love to see you in our next events. Um, and if there's any access or any questions, just just email us. You know the old-fashioned way. Just email us, WhatsApp us, and 
you know, uh, we will be in touch to give you um, uh, information that you would like. So thank you so much once again. Have a wonderful day. And uh, may you all be the light. And uh, we'll see you in the next event. Thank you. Namashivaya. Thank you. And oh, oh, the panel speakers, please stay for that uh, photograph that the team want us to do a group photo, apparently. So you all have to, only the uh, Prashant and uh, all the panel speakers and Ellison, Krishnashri, if you could have your cameras on. I don't know how that happens. Go for gallery. Yes, I think you go for gallery view. And yeah, a few more spaces. Jump on anybody you'd like. <laughs> Savita, Nina, everybody. Yeah, come on. Yep, there's Savita over there. All good? Yes, Nina, Savita, Arjun, Arvind, Priya. There's Amar. Is Amar good? Okay, I don't know if no one's gonna come. Ah, uh, that's Savita, yes, oh, Arvin, yeah. yes, yes. Arjun, Priya? Okay, shall we go for it? Yes. I don't know. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great job. Love you guys. Good night, Allison. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs>